So, thank you very much for that uh, uh, lovely introduction and also for finding that photograph that uh, makes me look, uh, makes me realize how old I'm getting. Uh, I'd like to hope that um, by giving the Torsten Gord uh, lecture, I also pick up some of his aging habits. Um, however, dinner with Hans last night uh, is probably going to mean that there's no way I will live as long as Torsten. Um, it really is an honor to give this talk. Um, this is my first trip to Sweden, and so it's wonderful to come here and to give a talk in the memory of, of Torsten Gord. I have no direct link, but I was trained by Uki Grenvik in Pittsburgh, uh, who a long time ago got his PhD at the Karolinska training under uh, Professor Gord. So, I'm going to talk about big data versus the randomized clinical trial. And I've put a question mark uh, after the title because I'm going to try to suggest to you that they shouldn't be in competition with each other. And I want to start with uh, another picture here. This is um, a good-looking Scotsman by the name of Archie Cochran. And uh, back in 1972 or so, he published a book uh, that was the result of several years of completing on behalf of the British government an analysis of the National Health Service. And in his book, he threw up his hands and said, the villains are the clinicians, and the true hero is the randomized clinical trial. And that was the birth of EBM, for better or for worse. It started with an indictment of the fact that physicians, surely only in Britain, but apparently physicians were making their mind up about what they thought worked, and they weren't really basing their clinical practice on solid evidence. And he felt you had to do this based on a randomized trial. And of course, the reason he wanted that that had to happen is because no matter what disease you study, that disease is always on a spectrum. There are some patients that are a little bit more sick, some patients that are a little bit less sick. And so the advantage of the randomized trial is that if you toss a coin, you can divide that population and get a, a balanced distribution of all the different distribution of the severity of illness of these different characteristics. You can then give one half a treatment, one half a placebo, and then if you wait over time, and then you compare the differences in how many people end up having a happy face versus how many people have, uh, still look sick, you can attribute the difference causally to the intervention that you gave. And so this is the essence of the randomized trial. The beauty of randomization is that it ensures a balance not only of the measured things, but also of the unmeasured things. All the things that you don't even know if they affect the outcome, it doesn't matter. When you do a randomized trial and you flip a coin, you get this nice distribution. And of course, the reason that Archie Cochran loved this is because Archie himself had participated in the first ever clinical trial, the Bradford Hill trial, which was published in 1948, and which was actually an early ICU trial. It was a study of pneumonia, tuberculous pneumonia, and they had a question, is treatment A better than treatment B? Treatment B was, I have tuberculosis and I have no treatment. Treatment A was, I have tuberculosis and I'm going to try streptomycin. Now, streptomycin isn't necessarily the best treatment for tuberculosis, but it was better than treatment B. And so, at least in this instance, when it was just A versus B in a very simplistic way, this two-group, parallel group trial was the perfect way to generate causal inference to say A is better than B. Now, the good news today is that um, this idea really took off. So around the time, uh, so the first trial was in 48. By the time Archie Cochran wrote his book in 72, there was still only about 100 or so trials being conducted in all of medicine across the world. By 2010, 37,000 new trials were being registered per year. Now the estimate is there are over 50,000 new trials being registered per year. It's amazing that there are 50,000 new questions that we haven't actually asked per year. 
but we've certainly got to this point where there is a massive explosion of the number of trials, and it's pretty much all EMA and FDA drugs and devices now only get approved. Donald Trump is trying to reverse this trend. <laughs> but uh, largely speaking, you now have to have randomized trial evidence for any new approval. And we've got pretty good at conducting RCTs. Uh, the methodologic conduct is much better. We generally remember to ask for consent. Uh, reporting is much better, and so on. But there's lots of things wrong with randomized trials. First of all, they're way too narrow. By way too narrow, what I mean is we get worried that we pick a narrow population that's not representative of the, of the whole group. At the same time, it's a Goldilocks story because they're way too broad. They give an average treatment result without adjusting for the fact that there's different patients within the trial, some of whom might benefit and some of whom might harm, be harmed. At the same time, treatment A versus treatment B isn't actually a very common question. A lot of the time in medicine today, the typical pneumonia patient sits in an ICU and the admission sheet, just when they're admitted to the ICU, has about 50 or 60 things on it. The surviving sepsis guidelines are now up to something like 93 separate statements of how you should take care of a septic patient. We don't ask whether A is better than B. We ask whether A is better than B, C, D, or E, conditional upon the fact that we gave F versus G or H versus I and so forth. So we have much more complex questions that we're juggling at the bedside. And at the same time, we actually don't really want to put our patients in trials because patients don't really want to be guinea pigs and we often feel that we are caught wanting to do the best thing for the patient. It's not clear to us that putting the patient in the trial is actually a safe or useful endeavor. In fact, what we've done today is that we've actually created two parallel universes. They look like each other. Clinical research looks like clinical care, but they actually exist with entirely parallel structures. They go on at the same time like sort of nether worlds of each other. Okay. So many of those problems have existed for, for some time. But recently, people have come along and said, don't worry. We have an alternative to the randomized clinical trial. Living in the 21st century digital age, we've moved into the era of big data. And I hesitate even to give capital letters to B and D. But you know it's a thing. You turn on the TV in the United States and during any big sporting event, there are now ads run by IBM for Big Blue and how Big Blue is solving every imaginable problem. One of the problems is the BioView project running in Vanderbilt, where they suggest that IBM is going to integrate so-called deep personalized data drawing down data from the electronic health record and crossing it with blood that has genotyped you. And with that, we will give you from the computer causal inference on optimal care that will be both broad in that it will be real world evidence drawn from the actual care of patients in the past, narrow in that it will be personalized estimates just for you and just for your patient and comparative in that it will consider all of the options, all of the potential therapies available. This is fantastic. Not only that, it will do it right now. This lovely piece in Health Affairs from Stanford envisions this notion of the doctor's big green button. You sit in the clinic with the patient in front of you, all the information is in the electronic health record, and running behind the scenes, a big regression model or a big cart model runs right there, takes all that personalized information and delivers all of that information just in time. An entire cohort study just for you, matching on your personal attributes. And that means no guinea pigs. You will be told, you and your doctor will get on the screen an estimate that says the best treatment option for you is X. So this is great. So everyone's signing on for this. In the United States, we have the Institute of Medicine, now known as the National Academy of Medicine. They've said, oh, this is, this is what we need. This is going to be the new learning health system. 
We're going to put all of healthcare onto the EHR. We will plumb the EHR and we'll get all the information we need. The CORNET, the National Patient Center Clinical Research Network, is promising the same thing. And the NIH with Francis Collins, he thinks it's fantastic. He went to the Obama White House and launched the Precision Medicine Initiative. And one of the core initiatives was that they were going to plumb big data to get all these personalized estimates. So it looks great. So if I find my inner Archie Cochrane and I go back and I generate an EBM report card on the grading for big data, how good is this new evidence? I would say, hey, it leverages the EHR. That's great. I don't know how much Sweden has adopted the EHR, but the EHR is so expensive that if someone thinks that there's now some way to leverage it to get useful information, at long last, something useful is coming out of the EHR. So that sounds terrific. Uh, low incremental cost, because you've already sunk all the costs into the EHR. Real world effectiveness, as I alluded to, that's great. But multiple therapies at the same time, also great. Personalized estimates, fantastic. Offering live tailored options, this is really, it's like we're just going to end doing randomized trials right now because this has solved everything. Oops. Just one problem. It doesn't actually generate robust causal inference because it doesn't account for unmeasured variables. It is still, for all the fanciness, just a large observational cohort study with all the biases that always exist in observational studies. And so the trialists stand up and they go, aha, see, this big data, it's crap. It's, it's, let, leave it up to us. We, we'll come back with a solution. You don't like old RCTs, we'll give you new RCTs. So the, new, the first kind of new RCT is the so-called point-of-care clinical trial. Now, some people might argue that they've always been doing point-of-care clinical trials. The cardiologists, certainly when they did the big acute myocardial infarction trials like Gusto and Isis, were trying to find a clinical moment, a point-of-care. Aha, I have chest pain. I'm clutching my chest and going, Ugh! I'm having a terrible acute myocardial infarction. That's a clinical moment randomized right there to streptokinase or not, or atenolol or not, etc. Okay. But what they mean nowadays by point-of-care clinical trials is having the electronic health record identify that clinical moment. So, in other words, the electronic health record alerts or triggers the clinical trial machinery. And the first and most pressing example is from the Veterans Administration in the United States, where it was published in 2011, they took inpatient diabetics with poor glucose control, and every time the physician was going into the computerized physician order entry to order either a sliding scale or a weight-based algorithm, the computer went, aha, we see you have a diabetic with high blood sugar, and you're about to order insulin. Do you know there's uncertainty in the right way to give insulin? We're running a trial of two different ways. Would you like your patient to be enrolled? And if you say yes, click here, and then we will simply randomize. If you say no, that's OK, but don't do that again. And so, and so they ran the trial. And they didn't solve diabetes, but they got to the end of the trial, and they showed this proof of concept. And people think this is fantastic. And so now there are two huge trials the VA is now doing a 13,000 patient trial of two different thighs eye diuretics for, for blood pressure control. The NHLBI priced out the traditional trial design at $92 million. The VA is running this trial for $9 million with no clinical researchers in the field. The whole thing is being done in the EHR. And then PCORI has funded the Duke Cardiovascular Research Institute to run Adaptable, a 20,000 cardiovascular disease trial of two different aspirin doses uh, going on in PCORI centers across the country. All right, so <laughs> this looks great. Now we can leverage the EHR, low incremental cost, real world effectiveness, robust causal inference because it's a randomized trial, but this is a pretty boring trial. Two doses of thiazides or two different doses of aspirin, that feels like A versus B. That's still a, an incredibly traditional trial design, 
Uh, there's no personalized estimates, and everyone's still a guinea pig. You know, everyone's just 50-50 chance, no, nothing has changed. So it's like, feels a little bit like this kind of trial design is good for the trialists in that it's lowered their costs, but it hasn't done anything else. Okay, so the trialists say, all right, you want another idea? Let me give you another idea about why we have a new design and you don't need to do big data. Um, So-called platform trials. Now, platform trials are a form of Bayesian adaptive trials that Scott Berry wrote about in JAMA a couple of years ago. And actually, Janet Woodcock from the FDA just wrote a very nice review in the New England about three weeks ago titled Master Protocols, where they talk about these kinds of trials. These are adaptive trials that focus on a disease, not on a particular therapy. They study multiple interventions, and they have perpetual enrollment. They keep enrolling until the disease is fixed, until it's not a disease. Um, usually based on Bayes' theorem, tailoring choices over time. But interestingly, so far, the focus has been exclusively in the pre-approval space with emphasis on small sample sizes and sometimes very small sample sizes. It's not trying to fix patient care. It's trying to help drug companies make smarter decisions largely around which drugs to take forward into phase three trials. And the poster trial is the iSpy2 program, which ended up having its first set of publications in the New England about 14 months ago, where there were three or four articles all in the New England at the same time on iSpy2. It's just testing novel therapies in different subsets. It actually tested eight different therapies in seven different biomarker-defined subgroups with an average of only about 50 patients in each group, very small sample size. And the outcome was just, should you take this drug from phase two to phase three? So it's not solving healthcare, but it's kind of sexy sounding. Okay, so let's look a little bit more at this. So how does the randomization work? Oops, that is not exactly the same as A versus B. Don't even try to read the writing. It's a very complicated design. So let's think about this. At the heart of it is something called response adaptive randomization. This is the key to these platform trials. So the traditional randomized trial, remember, at the start, in theory, you should have equipoise. So in theory, there's a 50% chance that A is better than B. At the end, if A is better than B, you declared, oh, we're more than 99% sure, p-value of 0.01. Okay, so you went from 50-50 to more than 99. That meant something during the trial had to be changing. So what was going on in the middle of the trial? All right, so imagine you were doing a planned trial of A versus B, you were gonna do 400 patients. And you're 40 patients into the trial. The color scheme's a bit weird here because I've shown alive in blue. And to this audience, blue probably just means hypoxic. Um, so, so dead is red and imagine the blue is green, nice and healthy. Okay, so we're 40 patients into the trial and you can see there's a lot more blue in the A arm than there is in the B arm. So there are 20, 20 in each arm, and uh, the 41st patient is your uncle. Which arm do you want your uncle to be in? I guess it depends on his will. <laughs> do you feel 50-50? Okay. Very few of you can feel 50-50. You don't know exactly what the probability is, but it doesn't feel, it doesn't feel 50-50. That's because it isn't. At this point, the probability that A is better than B is 78%. Now, 78% doesn't get you in the New England Journal of Medicine. We think A is better than B, p-value 0.22. Yes, send it to another journal. Act of Scandinavia, so they wouldn't take it either, would they? No. <laughs> oh! <laughs> I'm not getting invited back, I don't think. So. All right. So there's information here. There's information here. Imagine if you use this information and you said, for the next 40 patients, 
I am going to randomize not 50-50, but 78-22. In other words, if the probability that A is better than B is 80-20 or 78-22, let's actually keep placing bets on A and see what happens for the next 40. So you do 40 more patients, and it turns out your hunch was right in this instance. If that was the case, at this point, A is better than B is 99.9%. .9%. You, you adapted the randomization based on the response. That's the phrase, response adaptive randomization. And at this point, you can stop the trial. Now you have a very significant p-value. You can actually fully account for this move and, and design ahead of time the penalty paid for the looks, etc. There's nothing that actually stops you from doing this. So there are a couple of caveats. If the second 40 was flat, if it was just all random chance or goes in the opposite direction, then the trial would continue and the next bet just swings back to 50-50 as you go from the 81st to the 120. So you can bounce around. If your hunch was right, you're done early. If your hunch was wrong, you just swing back to the middle again and the trial keeps on going. The second caveat is that if it's A versus B, any of you, I know none of you are enjoying me taking you down memory lane of biostats classes, but you probably remember that Sample size is uh, the power is a function of the smallest of the two samples. So if it's a two-arm trial and you have one, uh, one arm much bigger than the other, the problem is you're still powered by the smaller group. So if you're only doing two groups, then response adaptive randomization isn't very good. But remember, we want to ask questions in multiple arms, multiple therapies, multiple subgroups. So in any time when you... Uh, if, if you have a homogeneous cohort with two arms, don't do this. But it's very interesting when you have multiple arms and multiple subgroups, which is, in fact, precision medicine, phenotyping into subsets of patients and so forth. So, response adaptive randomization, if you were doing a three-arm trial, you could start the trial a third, a third, a third to A, B, and C. As the patients go through the trial, they generate data the data can go into a pre-specified statistical model. And that model can then update the randomization rule to start changing the weights. So if B is doing better than A and C looks terrible, you could start to downweight C, load on to B while leaving a little A. If you can even have rules that triggers the addition of a new arm, such as arm D. You can have rules for dropping an arm and so forth. And you can have different rules for different subsets of patients. Sicker patients can still get one set of allocation while less sick get another set and so forth. All of that is, capa is, is capable inside a platform trial. So if we go back to our little generator report card, platform trials do consider multiple therapies, do generate personalized estimates, do offer live tailored options. What do I mean by that? If you are sitting there and it's halfway through the trial and treatment A is actually doing better than B, you'll be more likely to get A. So if it turns out that the best anyone knows on the planet is that A is 78% more likely than B to be the right thing for you, you'll have a 78% chance of getting A. So you're sort of a guinea pig, but like you're a guinea pig with VIP status. <laughs> this is not play the winner, but it's probably playing what's probably the winner. That's actually an important concept, and it's not by chance that I Spy 2 began in breast cancer. It was actually endorsed and driven forward by the Susan G. Komen Foundation. It was actually a patient-centered initiative to try to have a trial design that was a smarter trial design that patients preferred to be in. The problem, of course, is that it doesn't leverage the EHR. It's bloody expensive. It's still like a full-blown, preclinical, industry-funded trial, and it's not, at least thus far, doing any real-world effectiveness. And so then the issue is how can you marry the two? How can you take point-of-care trials and combine them with platform trials? 
And that's the so-called remap design, trying to have a randomized, embedded, multifactorial, adaptive platform trial, which is a mouthful, short for remap. And the, the first example is remap cap, randomized, embedded, multifactorial, adaptive platform trial for severe community-acquired pneumonia, which is now funded in the European Union with a huge grant and by the Australian and New Zealand um, NHMRCs. Simultaneously testing multiple antimicrobial treatments, different host immunomodulation strategies, and different ventilation strategies all at the same time, with separate response adaptive randomization and stopping rules for different subgroups of patients. Um, patients are preferentially assigned to the best performing arm, so the allocation is still random, but not 50-50. So halfway through the trial, if there's a particular regimen that's better for you, you'll be more likely to get it, which means you're not really a guinea pig. And the vision is that it's embedded and that it's all triggered by the ICU admission orders. So when you call for a bed for the ICU for a patient with acute respiratory failure of presumed infectious origin, it triggers enrollment and you get a customized ICU admission sheet that says this is the antibiotic you get, this is whether you get steroids or not, and so forth. Now, just to walk you through how this trial designs, there's some nomenclature you need to know. Domain is an area where a question is asked, such as a choice of antibiotic, whether to give steroids or not. Intervention is any option within a domain, and then the regimen is the recipe of that person's unique combinations of interventions within domains, uh, which can be different for different strata or stratum, such as whether you have shock or not. So, for example, regimen one is that in domain A, you get treatment one, A1. In domain B, you get B1. In domain C, you get C1. And then you can see that regimen two gets exactly the same domain A assignment, exactly the same domain B assignment, but then a different assignment in, in domain C. So these are all these combinations of therapies within different questions, all simultaneously in the same trial. So if that top blue thing is all the different questions you're asking, what you have to first of all do is do a pre-trial design and construction, where you have to say, this is the list of questions I want to ask, and then you build the architecture for the trial, and you build one big overarching model, which I'm not going to go through for you, but it has each group, each intervention, all the different combinations by different subgroups. Then you start the trial. Now, as patients arrive in the hospitals, the idea is to embed and pick those patients up electronically. They then filter through, they start off with even randomization. And as they go through the trial, data accrues. The data are then used to update and adapt the algorithm, sometimes hitting a trigger where you actually stop asking a question because you've now reached futility or superiority, or continuing to give updated randomization and you can even add in external adaptations. So why is all of this valuable? Because the design is trying to get closer to individualized treatment decisions. For example, should my patient with severe pneumonia receive IV hydrocortisone? At the bedside, a typical rounding ICU team would say it depends. It depends on whether the patient is in shock or not because there's some data that Steroids may help shock. It depends on how hypoxic the patient is, because if it's a bad inflammatory lung, maybe steroids will help with resolution. It depends, I guess, on whether the underlying cause of the pneumonia is viral. And if it is viral, is the patient on an antiviral? Because if they're viral and they're not on an antiviral and you add steroids, then you might make them worse and so on. I just point this out because this is the kind of conversation that you have every day at the bedside that's much more sophisticated than the traditional trial, but this trial would actually try to address all of these questions separately and would actually generate separate probability estimates for each consideration. And the trial essentially enrolls until a predefined level of certainty for each question while the trial is still running perpetually in the background. 
So let me try to close by suggesting to you what this would actually look like. So in order, when you're building the trial ahead of time, you then have to model the trial and run simulations. You run these Monte Carlo simulations under different scenarios of what the actual truth might be. So imagine we were taking care of pneumonia patients and we had three questions. And under each question, there were two alternatives. That means there's eight regimens, two times two times two, eight possibilities. So each dot here is the infinite but unknowable truth about the actual mortality rate for regimens one through eight, line from one to the eight. So we'll never know the infinite truth. We'll never be able to see all pneumonia patients ever cared for. But imagine if it were really true that regimens five and eight in the infinite population of, or even a finite population, 10 million pneumonia patients, it turns out that there's a 20% mortality rate when you get options five and eight. And you really don't want to be in options one, three, four, or seven because they're 30%. They're so that's 50% higher mortality rate. Okay, if you ran this trial on average, this shows how the trials try to discover the truth. It's a slightly complicated graph. The, the black line is what would happen if it was a typical trial. It's not two arms, it's eight arms. But if you do 2,000 patients, you can do the math, Every single patient would get, every single arm would be 250 patients. That's the black line. On average, the trial, which doesn't know the truth, but is trying to make bets and doing sequential updates and change in the randomization, the height of the gray bars is the actual sample size. So you can actually see that the trials knew to stay away from one, three, five, and seven, and load into five and eight. And then in dark red is the power, and in open red would be the power under usual design. You see that you get there with the same or slightly higher power. But importantly, because you were putting patients into the safer arms, during the trial, you had already caused 80 fewer deaths. And this is this point that while the trial is actually running, you're already caring better for the patients inside the trial. You're protecting the patients from the less advantageous arms. So if this was asking questions about things that are already in routine practice over which we have debates all the time, if there really were these treatment differences, then this is not experimental. This is actually in the doing comparative effectiveness and protecting patients at the same time. So that is truly self-learning healthcare system. If it turned out that arm eight was the only good arm sitting at 20%, then it easily learns to put everyone into arm eight with much higher power and even fewer deaths by avoiding going into the other arm. Now, when you give a state-of-the-art talk, you don't take any questions. So you can just put all the caveats in one slide and say, oh yes, there are a couple of trivial things that have to be solved. Look, this is going to bring the consortium of people trying to launch this trial to their knees. There are a huge number of issues in pulling this off, issues about what happens, how will you handle if the data in the EHR are inaccurate, how will you actually get the institutions to turn over and integrate their EHR, what does the ethics look like in the consent forms? Um, the statistics, uh, this guy Angus tried to make a few fancy slides, but I'm not sure I, uh, I buy half of it. Um, how do you report the results? The trial is still ongoing and you've declared part of the trial, but the rest of the trial is still being used for other questions. How do you do table one? Uh, when you, how do you do the consort on where all the patients are? <laughs> the issues are not trivial. Funding, you're going to write it to your, your funding agency and it gets to sample size and you say perpetual. <laughs> um, 
what are the oversight issues? Does everyone understand the trial design? Um, I'm a very successful clinical researcher. These guys want to come along and they want to do perpetual enrollment. How will I get my study questions answered? So there's integration with other clinical research programs. So I'm, uh, these are all very real issues and people are banging through these. I've just put them on one slide. That's just because it would be really depressing if I gave the whole talk on all the challenges, but there are real challenges. I don't want you to think that there aren't. But what I have tried to do is try to give a little window on a couple of issues. First of all, RCTs, they are still our strongest truth finder because of the R. The R is a beautiful gift to clinical medicine. Um, we can never know all the, all the unmeasured things, all the genetics, et cetera, that could, that could influence whether a particular patient would live or die. Observational studies, no matter how fancy they are, can't do a shortcut on that because they can only adjust for the things that they can see. The beauty of randomization is that it works on things that you can't see as well as things that you can see. So the act of randomizing is incredibly valuable and is worth preserving no matter how much RCTs drive us crazy. RCTs are incredibly irritating. There's, so, in fact, there's a session later this afternoon where I will continue to pile on about how excruciatingly awful RCTs are. But the R is beautiful and should be preserved. So the current RCT enterprise absolutely lets us down. But big data should not be cast as an alternative to the RCT. This is a false choice. Instead, big data are here because of the digital age. Electronic health records, powerful computing power to run simulations, to run much more sophisticated models. And so that allows us to actually think about using the digital, the digital age for novel RCT designs that are both smarter and safer. And so it's not going to be easy, um, but akin that this is, you're now about to see, I'm about to show you the very limits of my PowerPoint expertise. Self-learning healthcare is fused care and research. And with that, thank you very much.